raw negotiations have morphed into the political media equivalent of a stove left on high and then completely forgotten about. What's that smell? Oh no, I thought someone turned that off! Now with the Ron's breakout period for developing a nuclear weapon coming sooner than the next Marvel movie, negotiators are calling this round of Iran deal talks, or the Vienna talks, to be a make or break moment in this relationship. It's not great when mainstream news coverage includes suggestions like the Biden administration should just walk away from the talks and prepare for military action against Iran if its nuclear program crosses certain lines. Suffice to say, things are not going great over there right now. A senior western official put the odds of reaching an agreement at 30%. So now that everyone watching this is sufficiently terrified, let's get into the meat of the negotiations. Now there are two main stumbling blocks holding back an agreement. First, what are we going to do with all this nuclear material that Iran has made since America pulled out of the Iran nuclear agreement back in 2018? And second, just the general American idea that the Iran deal should encompass more than it currently does. So let's start with the more tangible getting rid of Iran's nuclear materials problem, because pop that can open and oh boy there are a bunch of worms squirming around in there. For starters, Iran is maintaining that they're not even trying to make nuclear weapons. Instead, they claim to be enriching uranium for energy and medicinal research. Now, depending on who you ask at the International Atomic Energy Agency, these claims are either ridiculous or entirely legitimate. Now, at large, this agency has said that they have found no evidence that Iran is making a nuclear bomb. Basically, right now Iran is successfully making and stockpiling a whole bunch of bullets, but they're yet to make a gun to load them into. Bullets, well, they could serve multiple purposes. Maybe you're making a belt out of them. I don't know, sounds kind of cool. Once you throw in the gun though, well, those explanations start narrowing quickly. Oh yeah, he's making those bullets to shoot something. Now on the other side, you have the Atomic Energy Agency's Director General, and he's come out and said that any country enriching at 60%, the level that Iran is currently enriching uranium at, is a very serious thing. Only countries making bombs are reaching that level. Now he would look at Iran's program and instead of the previous interpretation say, your argument that you plan on using this enriched uranium for these acceptable purposes is definitely plausible, but your current levels of enrichment are super overkill if that is really what you want to use it for. It's sort of like mounting an anti-aircraft gun into your bedroom and saying, yeah, I'm going to use this to defend against burglars. I mean, that would definitely provide adequate home defense, but so would a shotgun. What are you really planning to do over there? Uranium enriched at one third the amount is cheaper to make and easier to make while still accomplishing their same stated goals. So this leaves everyone starting at a really weird place in these negotiations, where Iran has a whole bunch of these overkill bullets but are insisting that they should be allowed to keep them because hey, we're not going to make a gun. For reference, the last time we came to this problem in the debate, Iran handed their nuclear stockpile over to Russia in exchange for Obama unfreezing $100 billion in Iranian assets and removing economic sanctions on their economy. The problem today is that a lot has changed in Iran since the last time we negotiated an Iran deal. Specifically, a new, more hardline Iranian leader and this crazy notion that America might renege on the deal we negotiate as soon as we get the next president in office. Don't know where that one came from. Now, The current Iranian leader has criticized his predecessor, saying that he had failed to get sanctions lifted even after Iran shipped 97% of its nuclear fuel out of country. Basically, America lifted the sanctions for a bit, but then put them back on with a few new ones thrown in there three years later. Now, From Iran's perspective, well, it's incredibly easy for America to reverse course and start putting those sanctions back on again. 
But on the other hand, it is quite the endeavor for a Ron to reverse course and start enriching uranium back to the quantities that they had given up to reach the agreement. Now because of this, the Iranian government is saying to America, give us a concrete deal you can't renege on or let us keep this uranium whilst not manufacturing the bomb part that accompanies it. Now, as of now, we're not really sure how negotiators are planning on crossing this bridge, but I'll let you know when we announce either a deal or nothing happens. Now, this brings us to the other point of contention, America. More specifically, the fact that this is just a reboot of the original, somewhat popular Iran deal. Now, like the original deal, this one would not limit Iran's missile development. It also would not halt Tehran's support of terrorist groups or proxy forces as some Democrats and nearly all Republicans have demanded. Now, This isn't a direct problem for negotiations, but it has led to a whole bunch of resistance from the derp state. Now, For starters, last week, 33 Republican senators wrote in a letter to the White House that any deal would likely be torn up by the next presidential administration as early as January 2025. Great for negotiations. Separately, a letter signed by more than 100 House representatives this week issued a similar threat. So basically, we're conducting these very serious nuclear talks with Iran while congressional Republicans are yelling at Iran from the corner of the room, don't listen to the president, everything you're concerned about happening is definitely going to happen. Don't make a deal. Now, it's easy to reduce this to a left right issue. Republicans want nuclear war and Democrats want to fund a government killing our troops and allies. But in reality, this all comes down to two conflicting cross party ideologies about how urgent a nuclear deal with Iran is. Now, a notable party defection is New Jersey Democrats and chair on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Emphasis on Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Want to get something done international? This is your guy. He declared publicly, I ask why we would try to simply go back to the JCPOA, a deal that was not sufficient in the first place and still doesn't address some of the most serious national security concerns we have. Now, for that New Jersey Democratic senator, the original Iran deal was the equivalent of paying a bully not to go out and buy a gun, but rather to just continue to sucker punch you and collude with your enemies like you'd been doing for decades. You know, acceptable levels of violence. As long as you continue to not spend your money on that weapon, well, I'm going to give you all sorts of access and perks. Republicans view this issue in a different way than Biden does. They're advocating for a continuation of the Trump maximum pressure campaign, something that will continue to be a reality as long as there is no Iran deal in place. They're basically chanting, status quo, status quo. Going into a little more detail on how they see the world, when Mr. Trump exited the original agreement in 2018, he promised to force Tehran into new negotiations, saying he would get better terms and also halt the country's support for the Syrian regime, its funding of terrorist groups, and its missile tests. Now, of course, considering the current conversation I'm having with you right now, well, you can imagine just how well that policy panned out. He never ended up getting Iran back to the negotiating table again, and instead, Iran doubled down on its nuclear programs and military activities in the region, and eventually ended up evading our sanctions by smuggling oil to key buyers to keep its economy afloat, as it waited for the Trump administration to finally leave office. Now, Most of you would look at that and probably think, okay, that was an abject failure. Tried to bring Iran back to the table for a more nuanced military issue focused discussion and they instead ignored us, developed a nuclear program and doubled down on the activities we were trying to talk them out of doing in the first place. Now instead of all that perspective, Republicans would argue, they totally would have come back to the table if they didn't have that glimmer of hope that a Democrat would come back to the loop in 2018. We're really trying to just smash down that last glimmer of hope and then 
well, we'll be able to bring him back to the negotiating table on our terms. They can either accept their current destroyed economic reality or negotiate a broader deal that would limit their military spending. Now, Biden, on the other hand, is driven by the same gut reaction that most of you probably had when I told you Iran has the capability to develop a nuclear weapon in a matter of weeks. Hold the phone on everything else. We're going to need to stave off a nuclear arms race in the Middle Eastern region. Now, Biden's plan seems to be, first, step one, make sure Iran doesn't develop nuclear weapons right now. And second, once nuclear weapons and economic ruin are off the table, cooler heads are probably going to prevail and we can build on that first agreement by working out the finer military details. Now with Iran nearing a nuclear point of no return, most people seem to be thinking that these ongoing Vienna talks are really the last opportunity for diplomacy to take over before things start getting front page newsworthy. Now for all of you watching, this is the official end of the episode, but before I leave you guys, I want to answer a few more points of legal nuance that I didn't include in the main segment for fear of things getting a bit too confusing. First, doesn't the president need Congress to commit to an agreement with Iran? Yes, if this was a treaty. Now this Iran deal, much like the original one, would be just that, a deal. We're going to shake hands on it and then operate on faith. The White House defined the original Iran deal as a non-binding agreement, rather than a treaty. If it were a treaty treaty, that would have had to have the official thumbs up from the Senate. It would have been much, much harder for Trump to leave and probably would have solved a lot of the problems. So why not codify this Iran deal with an official congressional thumbs up? That would solve a lot of problems in this negotiation. We have the majority in the Senate. Why not do it? Well, simply put, have you met Congress? Constitution says you need two thirds majority vote to approve a treaty and that is never going to happen. Because of that, we're stuck making these faith-based executive branch deals. Second nuance point, didn't Congress pass a bill saying that they could review and reject any nuclear deals made with Iran? Yes, they did, and yes, this would apply to this deal. Now I'm going to do a bit of a deep dive on this deal because if Iran and America actually come together and sing kumbaya together. Now I'm going to go into a bit of detail on this one because if Iran and America start shaking hands and singing kumbaya together, I guarantee you that politicians are going to make an explosive stink about this bill for one news cycle before promptly forgetting about it. it. Takes me two to three days to write an episode and I want you to know what they're talking about in real time. So let's get into it. Now there are two procedural arguments that are going to happen if Congress decides to exercise this congressional review bill. First, this is the same Iran deal as last time. We showed the deal to you in 2015 and you didn't exercise your self-given power to disapprove of it. Sure you didn't exercise that power because Democrats successfully filibustered the rejection bill, but let's not think about that one. Now, because it is a deal that Congress never officially disapproved of, people are asking, would Biden really need to resubmit it again? They didn't say no last time. Now the answer, well it depends on how expensive your lawyer is. Regarding the current status of this question, a United States State Department spokesperson did not address whether it would submit a deal that strictly renewed the 2015 accord to Congress, but said that Biden believed that a bipartisan approach to Iran was best and was going to commit to meeting that congressional review bill's requirements. So thanks for the clarity on that one, Joe. Now most people seem to think that it won't really matter much in the scheme of things considering that Democrats have a majority in both houses. Still, let's go a little deeper because we currently live in the worst timeline. What would happen if moderates like Menendez were to defect and Congress were to actually pass a bill rejecting the Iran deal? What would happen next? Well, the answer? What does a bill need to become a law? It needs to pass both the House and the Senate and then get the President's signature. Boom! 
Houston, we have found the biggest obstacle to this opposition strategy. You see, if both houses of Congress voted against the Iran deal in a joint resolution of disapproval, the president, well, he'd veto it. It would then require two thirds majorities in both chambers to overturn that veto and kill the agreement. Now, this could end up all probably being a dramatic spinning of the wheels if it actually comes to it. So that's my 200 level class on the Iran deal law. Let me know if you like the format of teching on just a little bit of more complex legal information at the end of the episode in the comments. I won't always do it, but sometimes I find interesting rabbit holes that only tangentially relate to the core of the topic I'm talking about. Thank you and that's all I have to say about that. Hello YouTube, I'd like to thank my patrons for helping me put out my videos. If you want to support independent nonpartisan news looking into the overlooked, and wow, this story was actually overlooked, join the growing list of exceptional individuals over here by clicking on that link in the description. Also remember to subscribe and ring that bell so that freedom will continue to ring. Give me a thumbs up if you like what you saw, and lastly, as always, thank you for watching.